This is, I believe, number five of our EDU series. Uh, we've been running them since uh, mid-April and uh, going strong with people interested and uh, uh, sending us questions and giving us ideas. My name is Alessia. I run a company that is called HomeWeb, as in Home Work in Progress. So why are we talking about uh, accessory dwelling units here? Because the construction process has become so complicated that people who have never done it before don't really know where to start. And that's something that we're trying to uh, deal with during these conversations so that people can jump in, ask questions, get it all sorted out in their heads. So for those who have joined us for the first time, quick catch up on the vocabulary that we're using. So ADU is accessory dwelling unit. We can also call it a backyard cottage, granny unit, uh, in-law unit, secondary house. We are also using terms detached and attached. And you can see that a detached ADU is basically a separate secondary house on the same property where the main house is already uh, built. It might have been a garage previously and people might want to convert this into an ADU. There are also terms like conversions, and that usually happens with garages and basements. And some people repurpose existing space into an additional unit. There is also something called junior ADU, which is again a part of the existing living space that you can use to rent out. I'll jump into step two because the step one is actually something that I call the wish list, and that's the space we're in pre design, pre construction. Step two is feasibility. After you've decided what exactly you want, you need to figure out how to make sure that you can actually do it on your own property. And there are three, things, three ways to go about it through your planning department, through a builder who might help you figure it out, or through symbium.com the online service where you can uh, type in your address. Right now it's up for San Francisco, San Jose and several other municipalities. The event we had in April on financing covered several different types of financing that you can use for the building of your unit. I have parked all this information on the dedicated website. I'll share the link uh, in the uh, chat. And this brings us to today's session where we are trying to figure out how to design and build. And with the number of people who say that they can build an ADU, I think what we've been doing during March is actually figure out who has already done it, who is working in it, how they're working in it. And that brings us uh, to today's event. Uh, we have today with us Carrie, who is the architect with uh, inspired ADUs and Alex, who is the CEO of uh, the company called uh, Cottage. Both of them are what we call ADU practitioners. And uh, if you don't mind, I'll start with you, Carrie, because I also believe that you're the one who has started building them first. Was it 2008? Yes. Yeah. And before we jump into ADUs, would you mind uh, telling us, because I, I have obviously used uh, your name and your credentials in the intro, Eventbrite and wherever I've shared the event. And there are several letters there after your name that I think people would love to know what they actually mean. Sure. So I am the owner of Larson Shores Architects. And that is an architecture firm I started in 2003 with my business partner. He and I did our masters at Berkeley together for architecture. And then in about 2008, actually coming out of the last recession, we got very excited about ADUs as a way to make the Bay Area more affordable, uh, especially to allow families to pool resources and figure out how to come together and maintain that balance between having multiple generations for childcare and at senior care and having families together just because we're living longer and people choose to do that. So we started a separate division of our architecture firm that's called Inspired ADUs. We have a real focus and passion for making everything we do accessible, but as a business model, it turns out most people don't want to talk about aging, even though it's better to be aging than not. So what we've done is really tried to challenge ourselves as architects to do really beautiful designs that help people stay as independent as long as possible. And the ADU is just such a perfect model for that. 
So the initials after my name, I'm a LEED accredited professional. So LEED is a green building standard in the architecture world. And then I'm also a certified age in place specialist, which is a designation you can achieve that's helping you understand how to design for aging specifically. So this is our parent company, Larson Shores. We have a nine person team that works on both ADUs and our traditional architecture projects. This is a two story ADU right there. And our work with Larson Shores has been more of a contemporary slant. And when we started working on accessory dwelling units, we did a lot of focus groups with seniors because that was initially who we really wanted to start to solve the problem for. And when we started to work with the seniors, we really understood, while as modern architects, we love the beautiful glass and steel boxes, they don't make the most sense for everybody. They don't necessarily make the people in the in-law comfortable. Sometimes they can feel like they're a little bit in a fishbowl. And so what we've done is we have a model where if we've designed an ADU and it's living well for someone and we feel like it's easily repeatable, we put it into what we call our standard plan set. And then those plans we can streamline, we can deliver at a more affordable price. Clients can come on and they can search for plans of different sizes. They can start to look at different building dimensions and specifications. I think we're about to add 18th plan to our catalog. So what we offer is that people can take this plan and this elevation and we can fast track your permit as what we call a tier one. And then if someone likes the floor plan, but it doesn't look like it's gonna maximize their backyard and they wanna kind of maximize the investment, we can take one of our plans and we can then stretch or add on or change the roof line to meet your architectural style. You can see this cottage has a more traditional look. Some of our other cottages are a bit more contemporary. And I'm just gonna pop down to Addison. And so what we do then is offer that as a tier two. So clients can buy that plan set and then they just pay by the hour to do the modifications. And then we can always do a custom plan for people. We call that a tier three. We have our full architectural team. So if people want to do something custom, we can get into that. So what we've been trying to do is that when we started in 2008, we worked with a modular company and it was really exciting but then that company was no longer in business. Uh, the modular didn't fit in everybody's backyards. We went with a couple panelized companies and those are exciting, but again, they kind of have come and gone. And I think there's some really new exciting things happening in the market now that the laws are so supportive of ADUs. We're seeing some really innovative things coming from the tech world that are allowing us to streamline things and deliver some you know, products at a, at a different margin. And we have a couple things in the fire, hopefully that'll come to be, but right now we do stick built. So we match make clients with contractors in their region. The plans are done. We have a series of kind of mood boards and different interior packages. And so what we can do that some kind of custom people can't do and I'm just gonna switch over to our portfolio, is we can, we can customize all the interior finishes for you and it doesn't change the package. So if you want something more traditional, we can kind of do this nice, clean, warm look, and then we can scroll down. And again, we love accessibility. So we always have kind of roll-in showers and everything in certain reach zones for access. But then you can start to see that through our work, we can really give you different look and feel. So this was a one car garage in Berkeley that we then bumped out to meet the new setback laws. And it's only 294 square feet, but it turned out to be just, you know, a super fun, interesting, you know, kind of more unique cottage. Um, always thinking about how we can create interesting connections to the outside, light borrowed space to make things feel bigger just clever ways of maximizing storage and pull down and efficient kitchens. So that's kind of what we offer, these pre-designed plans, and then we can modify them for clients, help them figure out their interior, and then match make them with a local contractor. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Carrie. Let's hear from Alex. So I'm Alex. I'm founder and CEO of Cottage. We're a San Francisco-based company that makes it easy for homeowners to build custom ADUs. And 
And to, you know, to speak to my background a little bit as it pertains to ADUs and, and outside of ADUs, I grew up in a home with an ADU, so grew up alongside those tenants. In my parents' home today, there's the art from our tenant who was an artist. I once had a surfboard from a tenant who left their surfboard there when they moved out. So I have that experience from that side. My wife and I lived in ADU for about a year in Coal Valley um, in San Francisco. And I, you know, I've been helping my parents through the process of building an ADU in their home in Palo Alto, which I'll show you a bit of that project. And frankly, started Cottage out of the pain points that we personally felt along the way. Um, so I'll describe that a little bit more. My professional background before this, so I, I, you know, most recently was at a venture capital fund. And then before that, spent about five years launching and building the Uber business and Uber Eats business around the globe. So I'll just, you know, quickly, I'll take you through um, some quick slides and then you want to leave plenty of time for Q&A. So we are Cottage. I think we have Kevin on the call as well. We're all about making custom ADUs easy. You know, this is a bit of our team and, and Kevin is here on the call today. We have Anamika, who's Cornell Masters of Architecture, has been you know, recently doing work at WeWork. And we have Lou just joined the team, you know, a couple of weeks ago, who's, who's heading out of our business operations. And we have Frank, who's a 30 plus year general contractor around the Bay Area that we partnered with here. You know, we like to say that if you live in the Bay Area, he's built something in your neighborhood, whether that's an ADU or whether that's, you know, single family home, he's done stuff from, you know, our 215 square foot ADU to $10 million mansions. So we're, we're really pleased to be partnering with him on this. So, you know, if you're on this call, I probably don't need to explain to you why you'd be interested in having an ADU. You know, generally the folks that we speak with, it comes down to some extra space to keep friends and family close, you know, rental income or boosting the value of your property. And, you know, we, we see a pretty interesting spectrum of, of people across the area that we, we speak to. We also see people at different stages of the process. Um, and we're happy to speak with you if you are just considering you know, building an ADU, we're happy to speak with you if you already have plans and permits and, and we can kind of tap in accordingly along the way. But, you know, generally the folks that we speak to, to, you know, fall into one of these buckets, whether it's, you know, empty nesters who recently have had kids go off to college um, and are trying to, you know, get a little bit more of, the, of their extra space. You know, folks that are, are retiring, thinking about aging in place. First time home buyers who are looking to, to save a little bit of money or, or offset their monthly payments um, with rental income or a you know, small time you know, property investor who has a few rental properties and is just looking to increase that yield. We're able to work with all these groups. You know, frankly, all these groups are, are friends and families that we've spoken to along the way. So you could very much put you know, my wife and I in that first time home buyer bucket. You could put my parents in the retirees bucket. So, you know, the big question, you know, 80s are such a great investment, you know, Frankly, I'd say a lot of homeowners have thought about it, but you know, we've been trying to answer the question, why aren't more homeowners building ADUs today? And for us, you know, from going through the process, we felt like it's these three major pain points. The first is complexity. So you know, between dealing with the planning department, the building department, finding an architectural designer, a contractor, if you wanna rent it out, a tenant or property manager, it's just very easy to get lost or screwed along the way. The second piece is just how opaque pricing is. This, it's crazy that you can't get a price until you're kind of $20,000 in. And you know, while you may see uh, an advertised price on some of the prefab and, and modular builds, there are a lot of you know, essentially you know, fees and extra costs along the way, which, which do add up. Whether it's you know, city permitting fees, whether it's site prep, foundation, utility hookups. Just in terms of opaque pricing, you know, whether it's a traditional, you know, architect or general contractor or some of the advertised prices on, on prefabs and modulars, it's very hard to know what you're going to pay, very hard to, to estimate all these fees. And, you know, frankly, uh, that's, that's a big leap to take for a lot of homeowners. You know, third, in terms of financing, you know, very few homeowners have, you know, $100,000, dollars $300,000 of cash up front to, to pay for one of these ADUs. And, the banks are starting to wake up to the opportunity that ADUs provide, but most banks and credit unions don't include the appraised future value of your ADU or the potential rental income into their underwriting. So we think there's an opportunity there as well. So with Cottage, the way we want to solve this, we want to offer you a no hassle process, an upfront price, and great financing options. 
Um, you know, yes, yes. We are doing custom built ADUs. These are not sheds. These are not prefabs. We're not creating anything into your backyard. Benefits of doing this, I'd say one, it's that you can, you know, match the ADU to the unique characteristics of your, your property, you know, both interior and exterior. Second, we'll talk about kind of the ROI that's provided by a custom ADU versus a, a prefab. You know, I think in general, a lot of us get excited about ADUs when we see these, you know, beautiful boxes on an Australian bluff on Dwell's Instagram. But when we actually, you know, think about that in our own space, we're dealing with slopes, we're dealing with heritage trees, we're dealing with different orientations, and ultimately, you know, a lot of homeowners, you know, skew towards, towards custom. You know, second, you know, the no hassle in the process, ultimately, like, we're taking care of it for you. So we can handle feasibility, design, permitting, construction, every step along the way. And we're also helping to, to make introductions to, to financing partners that we find understand ADUs and are providing competitive rates. And then third, in terms of value, so we are able to get access to pricing because we're doing this in a partnership at scale with our general contracting partner, which you are not going to get independently. And that results in obviously a better ROI for your project. So maybe quickly, I'll take you through um, some of our early projects uh, with Cottage. First one is, is close to my heart because this is the, uh, the home that I went to high school and, and my parents have been living in the past um, 20 plus years. Um, so this is on, on Marion Avenue in Midtown Palo Alto. You know, the purpose of this unit is my, my family is trying to plan around how they can afford to stay in Palo Alto you know, when my father retires. And, and they're, I think, planning to, to earn something around 2250 to 2500 a month in rental income from this very compact 215 square foot ADU. So what we're doing on this project, and I'll show you floor plans just after, is we are essentially you know, building in this, this attached carport, you know, making it something that has an opportunity to do and structural support for uh, a future storage or sleeping loft to open up a bit of additional area. So here, you know, you can see the floor plan. We're doing a slight bump out, but we're, you know, we're, we're complying by everything, you know, Palo Alto will throw at us in terms of the permitting process, which, which has been, you know, I'd say a, a multi, a multi revision 60 day period so far. We're hoping to, to pull permits, you know, really over the next couple of days. Um, uh, did you say 60 days? The cities with the most attention to detail are asking for a kind of a pre-submission meeting and then oftentimes we'll provide comments on your first submission. So we're at that stage of kind of that second submission has gone in. We've answered all their questions, boundary survey, all, all of the above. Um, and we're hoping to pull permits, you know, very shortly. No, I think it's just that 60 days still sounds amazing. I know that the new legislation says 60 days, but we also have been there with projects last year, which started June, and we got the permits, I think, January this year. So yep. if even Palo Alto is now capable of pulling through within two months, I think that sounds amazing. You'll hear different things in different municipalities, but our general take is that the shelter in place order is actually a great time to submit your permits because the, the planners are not sitting there with a line you know, of, of you know, an hour's worth of people at all times when their office is open to come in and ask them you know, questions. So it's generally you know, better prepared, more serious you know, architects and builders who are, are providing these, these submissions and it can be processed remotely. Um, yeah, so we're, right. we're very yeah. optimistic there. I'll run through a couple more projects quickly. So this is in, in Los Altos. This is an ADU that we're in the process of, of designing with the homeowner. You know, this is kind of an interesting dual purpose. So the homeowner has, is paying rent for, for their adult daughter in downtown San Jose. And they're saying, hey, we could save money by financing this unit, building an ADU backyard and having her live there. And then ultimately, they're also kind of designing it as their future retirement home. And so they've been super involved in the design process. It's been really fun to work with them. And, and we're starting to see this, this take place. One kind of interesting note that we're working on this project is probably the largest heritage oak tree I've ever you know, personally seen with my own eyes, you know, which obviously you can see on the kind of satellite view images takes up um, a good bit of, of the property. So we're working around this in a way where we can you know, tie in with utilities and make sure that we're not da damaging any of, of the um, existing roots. To give you a sense of, of the floor plan, so we're actually going to be fitting this in and matching it in with a, an existing deck that has a hot tub there 
you know, it's, 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 it's ultimately going to be a family compound. So, you know, they're, they're fine with the, the open French doors between the two homes and, and want it to feel more cohesive than separated, which, you know, we do see with a lot of, you know, more rental focused units. And then, you know, last project I'll highlight for you guys is, uh, is one in downtown San Jose. So this is, you know, prime San Jose state rental area. This is a, a property investor um, who's actually also a, a mortgage broker. Um, so we have great conversations around the ADU financing. And, you know, this is ultimately to increase the yield on what is already a, a duplex. This is a kind of interesting scenario where, you know, this is a relatively flat lot. You could, in theory, crane, you know, prefab in there, but they've decided to go um, with a custom ADU approach here because, frankly, we can beat them in pricing as well. So we're building a 660 square foot, two bedroom, one and a half bathroom uh, unit here. And, um, you know, just about to kind of kick off the, the finalizing of the designs and permitting process. Uh, I'll give you a quick snapshot of, of that floor plan as well, so you can see it. I see small print there that there were some septic. That's like the biggest unknown. And people worry like how much could it cost? So how do you deal with that? We believe in price transparency and upfront pricing. So the, the most transparency you can possibly give the homeowner as possible, but also there are things that you don't know until you start digging, right? So on, on this project, as an example, we're signing the LOI, you know, with the, the LOI goes to the homeowner with basically carve outs and saying, okay, this is an area not included in this estimate and it could have a range of X to X, right? So for example, I think this one was like around $5,000 of, you know, an estimated variable in the case that we need to upgrade that sewer line. So, and then when we do that, you know, that's just basically, you know, build that cost, right? So that's, you know, labor and materials, those receipts for the materials the homeowner ends up getting to see. So, you know, that's, that's, you know, the best way that we can predict something, which is, you know, potentially, you know, you know, 30, 40, 50, 100 year old um, utilities. As part of our process, what we do is we, do a, a joint design consultation and site visit. So our architectural designer and contractor come out to your property. They actually assess, you know, with their own eyes, what's possible and, and what this might cost. And that comes to you in, in your estimate. So, you know, ultimately we do this on a case by case basis because it's a really big difference. If you're drawing the sewer line you know, hundred feet into a backyard, you know, down a 20% grade slope, you know, through a redwood grove versus, you know, just kind of tying up to the existing home on, on something that's closer to the, to the, to the street. Sure. When we're starting with clients, what we do is identify the areas very similar to Alex, where, where you could find unknown costs. One of the fun parts about detached ADUs versus renovations or additions is that you don't have a lot of those uh-oh moments. So it's, we want to put the placeholder in. So it's, do we have to upgrade the electricity? You know, does the house have a 200 amp panel um, so we can pull the electricity off or do we need to upgrade that service? Or are we trying to go net zero and do we want to upgrade to a bigger panel for solar? You know, and that can be around a $3,500 charge for the electrical upgrade. Very rarely have we had to upgrade the water line. Typically the water line has been big enough to just pull that utility. Now we're dealing with the fun new piece of who allows gas and who doesn't. So Berkeley, for example, has outlawed gas. There's no gas. We're doing some ADUs down in Campbell. And uh, Campbell right now is allowing gas for cooking, but not for heating the system. And then for the sewer connection, it's really a calculation of figuring out, you know, if it's a flat site, we've got to get a quarter inch of drop per foot to move sewage. Obviously, it's always best to move sewage with something that doesn't break, like gravity. But you can put in an ejector pump and that has, you know, it's about $750 and more importantly, we have to find a spot for it on the site or in the footprint. So those things are solvable, but it's like Alex said, it's about identifying those unknown costs so that homeowners, you know, know what to expect. So we start with listing out the, those pieces and then we do our due diligence when we go out for the site visit with the contractor and establish um, those pieces. Um, and I think a good kind of... Uh... What sort of information would you love to have ideally from them so that you could kind of uh, move in quicker with planning? Well, we'd love to see a picture of the electrical meter, super exciting. That helps us understand whether it's sized appropriately or we're gonna need to do that. 
you know, some real time pictures of the yard are always great. So we can get a sense. Google Earth and Symbiums tools are amazing. We love those, but Google Earth is not always that up to date in terms of what trees are still there, what structures are still there. And then the biggest thing for us is understanding what the goals are for our clients of whether it's really about designing for flexibility of use or a specific use. We do a lot of multi-generational living. And so when an, an aging parent is leaving their house and moving into an ADU, there's a lot more emotional understanding that we need to look at. We need to really design for all the important pieces, furniture they're bringing over, things that are important to them so they can really help understand that this is their new home. So it's kind of the kind of what the goals and values are. Is it about going fast and getting rental income? So those are the things for the, the wish list and the how how we're going to use it is really what we love to hear. Yeah, okay. something something I might add to that is we oftentimes, you know, get on the phone with the homeowner and they're like, what's it going to cost me? Right. And that's even before we know, are we looking at something that's this glassy thousand square mm -hmm. foot box? you know, or is this a 300 square foot garage, detached garage conversion? It's hard to answer those questions until we really know what we're, we're trying to build there. So, you know, similarly as part of our kind of, you know, first conversation with the homeowner, we want to know all those preferences. And from our perspective, the more you've done your research, the more you can send us the, like inspiration, floor plans, Pinterest boards, you know, sketches on the back of a, an envelope or napkin, that's all helpful for us to be able to actually answer your questions sooner rather than later. I, I'll put in one more comment here from our previous uh, conversations. People confuse this cost per square foot with the main house construction. And it's a big um, stumbling block for most builders because we know that the utilities package that goes on the small footprint is basically uh, conceptually the same as the one that goes on the main house, but the price per square foot grows. I can throw a number like 400 there per square foot, but it might be cheaper, it might be more expensive depending on the situation, depending on that particular site, right? And I think there's an unfortunate math is that you're paying to put a whole house in a small footprint, as you're saying. And what we've found is it's the first three to 400 square feet that are really the most expensive. And then there's a bit of a return. So we, we actually have had a lot of clients come and say, we really want to save a lot of money. We just want to do a 300 square foot ADU. But in truth, you know, a 500 square foot ADU is going to get you a lot more rent and is not going to be an exponential cost increase. There's kind of a sweet spot we found between our five and 700 square feet ADUs where we're really maximizing we're able to bring the cost per square foot down a little bit to help it be a little more digestible and then you're getting more rents back So, And now that we're seeing the state laws changing and we're working on some of our bigger units that are, you know, 800, 890, 1200, then we'll start to see some of those numbers per square foot go down again because it's the living rooms that don't have built-ins or plumbing or fancy things in it that are large spaces that help reduce the cost per square foot. Thank you, Carrie. Great explanation. Great explanation. Thank you. But, but you know, like people want numbers. So if both of you could share the number, like the, the cheapest that you have seen that you've built and the most expensive that you've built, you know, so the, we just want the range. Like, and then of course I'll ask like what made the cheapest one, the cheapest one. <laughs> The three projects that I showed you, all of these are less than $200,000. So, you know, the smallest one on, on these slides, we're looking at an estimate of 110. And the, the, you know, most expensive one on here is like a little bit under 190. And that includes design and build. That does not include city permitting fees, which, you know, obviously um, are, are a, a tough Tough calculation to do beforehand. I think for us, we're seeing the costs come in between $400 a square foot and then $550 is like a, a pretty normal. Our projects have a lot of built-ins in them. We, we really think that the small spaces work better if we're really thoughtful about the design and we really figure out how to maximize that space. And you'll often see in our images, we have built-in banquettes and all the banquettes have storage under the drawers and it kind of helps free up floor space. But those built-ins and pieces you know, add on and cost more. Carrie, um, I have to stop you there because that's, there is something very important that you're saying. 
people keep comparing costs per square foot without actually asking this question, what's included? Right. And I have this, you know, like I usually say, compare apples to apples. So when you have these slides from a builder, ask what do they include and what they do mm -hmm. not include? Because I think that makes the whole calculation, like if we compare something with built-ins, with something that is just a shell, and you will be thinking that you're comparing apples to apples. You know, in reality, you are comparing like two different projects. Right, right. And I think the other thing is you have to look at what level of quality and construction you're gonna get. I think that's another big thing that people don't differentiate. And there's something unusual with these ADUs that you don't see in home renovations. Like when you're doing a kitchen renovation, it actually is the cost of the counters and the cabinet and the tile that really start to drive up the cost of that particular project. And we've seen a lot of ADU clients come to us and say, well, we're gonna save money by you know, being really smart about the interior finishes. Well, the truth is there's probably 11 feet of kitchen. So even if you wanna do a beautiful marble counter, it doesn't actually affect the big picture number. It's the inherent infrastructure of the ADUs that you're paying for, and that's the expensive part. And we've just added this January with the new legislation and with the new building codes, we've just added one more expense, which is called solar. Mm -hmm. And that's just extra 10,000 to any project, right, Alex? <laughs> right, uh, the, the quotes that I, I gave you did not include solar. That's you know generally done by a completely different company, but um, yeah, yeah. I think you're right. Yeah. yeah, it's just one of the expenses that we have to think about when we think all these uh, costs. We will jump into Q&A, whatever we have in the chat in a minute. Uh, but before we do that, I want to ask, I'll start with you, Alex, because you're already on my screen. You have moved from an ADU and you've lived in an ADU. And I think you have to be really specific about what expectations people have when they think about moving into a small space. So how did it work for you guys? Sure. So our story is unique. We actually sold all our stuff and traveled around the world for a year. So we were coming back with very little when we were moving into the ADU. So it wasn't too bad, actually. It was a <laughs> studio ADU, I think around 300 square feet. So it didn't even really have um, room for, for a couch, which we didn't know. I'd say the first thing you need to think about is like, who are you designing this ADU for? If this is going to be your retirement home, yes, you're going to have mementos and you're going to need lots of storage. And you want to be really thoughtful around, you know, built-ins, little nooks between the studs, things like that, that, that can give you that extra to space, space to store. If you're renting this out to a university student, a grad student, you know, a generally a young person, they're going to have less stuff, right? They haven't had as many years to accumulate and generally they're pretty light. I think this also goes into the, the way that you design kitchens, right? I think homeowners who have been in their homes for a long time, the expectation is, you know, four to six burner stove, you know, big fridge that you can go do Costco runs on. A lot of the people, you know, in the Bay Area you're renting this out to are ordering food delivery, you know, generally in non-COVID times going out to eat. You don't need a dishwasher. You know, you can save, you know, a couple thousand bucks on that. You don't need a terribly large refrigerator. You know, your appliances need to be functional, compact, and reliable so that you're not constantly having to fix or buy new ones. Carrie, over to you. I think storage yeah. for somebody who is planning to age in space is a different story. Yeah, I'm just going to show you a little bit. I mean, this is a model we did for an 83-year-old um, grandma who left her house of, you know, 40 plus years in Belmont. And she was really worried about downsizing and where everything would go. So, and she really wanted to cook and entertain the, the family before COVID in the front house used to come over for dinner every, every Sunday. And she wanted to be able to cook. One of the things about the smaller appliances is that they tend to be more expensive, ironically. So when we can, we keep a standard 30 inch stove in. This is a 24 inch um, refrigerator. There's a great European style range of 24 inch refrigerators that are awesome, that are pretty reasonable. But we do things like we don't do the bar seating on the back of our peninsula because the dining room seating is right here. So we put extra storage on the back of the um, peninsula. We have a little cubby in the corner. She keeps her laptop in there. There's a plug set in there. And then you'll see all the banquette drawers are storage and this one on the side pulls out so she can access that 
for place settings for the table, but really dialing in a lot of those things really helps people feel like the transition isn't so hard. And so, I mean, that's something that we've built into all our units and that keeps us, you know, not necessarily as the cheapest option, but that's not necessarily where we're trying to be. We want to really be a great value where we've thought through a lot of what's important to people to make sure that the, the cottage really lives the best it can for people. Thank you. There is a question about how Berkeley and Albany treat the homes where you're adding on new ideas. And I think it's about uh, taxes more than anything and bringing it up. You do need to bring up to go to the main house if you are doing something new in the backyard. So it's, if it, you're doing a detached structure and it's a freestanding structure, that's the beauty of these structures is that you do not have to bring the main house up to current codes. It's a, a clear division of kind of church and state, for lack of a better word. You're only working in the backyard. The new laws in January also put into some effect some, some pieces that say you can't penalize those homeowners for having things in the main house that aren't compliant. So it's, it can be simple that way. But sometimes you have, you know, maybe a five-bedroom house and they're not using all of it and they want to kind of carve out and capture part of the main house and then do a bump out to expand, that can be a more affordable way to get an ADU, but you have to understand that you're going to have at least seismic structural upgrades to the main house. You don't necessarily, you're not going to have to go in the kitchen of the main house and upgrade the, you know, electrical outlets to meet today's codes unless you're changing the kitchen. But there are some kind of, you're going to have to prove that the house overall is going to move and perform um, correctly in an earthquake. And that could have a, a little bit of added cost and and increased uh, range. How does the, the permitting process go in uh, places like Berkeley? I think Berkeley will be challenged under the new legislation. We have been permitting ADUs in Berkeley for about 12 years and the plans are not dramatically different and the amount of building permit comments we get back are wildly different every single time. So there's a little bit of an efficiency problem there. The state law says they have to approve it complete permit in 60 days and historically it was taking us five to six months to get through Berkeley. So that's obviously a, a big speed up for them. We have been submitting ADUs in Berkeley during shelter in place. One of the great things about Berkeley is that they were, they had their whole setup online before shelter in place. So like some of the other municipalities who didn't have that set up, they're moving a lot quicker and faster in terms of uploading permit submittals and responses. I just got two plan check combats yesterday, so I think they're on track to meet their 60-day, even in this under, you know, unusual time. Yeah. Yeah. When the shelter-in-place order went into effect that kind of stopped all construction, Oakland came out later and said the only thing we will be processing right now is accessory dwelling units to make sure that this housing, you know, crisis doesn't go to that next level. They're now back up and running on everything as we're loosening some things out, but I think cities are really trying to push these forward to keep the you know, I think it's pretty important actually for the economy and I think ADUs might very well be one of the big pieces that will help our economy rebound if we can get these construction pieces going. We have one under construction in San Carlos and that's gone to online inspections. You know Berkeley is doing online inspections but I heard from my contractor yesterday the delay to get an inspection is where we're seeing the log jam from the building department side. I don't know where you guys are Alex with Palo Alto. Similar. So just you know longer timelines to get inspections. One, one more thing to ask you guys about. I know both of you have dealt with garage conversions. So any red flags that a homeowner should think about before they kind of push the button? <laughs> well, I think for us, we, I feel like the buzzkill when it comes to garage conversions because uh, people come to us, they think, oh, okay, I've got this 1930s garage it's got some power and I'm going to just convert that and keep things really, you know, inexpensive. But the truth of the matter, if you look in your garage and it's two by four walls that aren't going to be thick enough to handle insulation that they'll need to have today, and there's lumps and cracks and potentially water coming up from your foundation, that foundation wasn't designed uh, for the, you know, structurally to support uh, a living space. So often we have to, you know, basically either hold up the garage, rebuild the foundation, and then thicken the walls and the ceiling of the garage to make it compliant with today's building codes. 
and you're not always saving money. Um, where you can benefit is that if you're in that zero to four foot setback of the property line, you're an existing non-conforming structure, so you can keep that piece. Some people are really, you know, to preserve their backyard, want to make sure they maintain that that space, but it's not always really super cost effective. And that's the heartbreaking news when I go out there often. Yeah, I would, I would add to that, that oftentimes a garage conversion is really a garage replacement. And, you know, similarly, I think people sometimes, you know, I've been guilty of this in the past thinking, oh, you know, you just, you know, you know, just kind of finish the walls and put some flooring down. But yeah, that won't have plumbing, that won't have you know, sewage, water, you know, may have electrical, but, you know, then you're essentially, you have a, a semi-finished space that's probably not very structurally sound. You can't rent it out legally or frankly, illegally. So if you do want to do a garage conversion, it oftentimes, you know, requires you know, fully pulling out, building a new foundation. You may be able to keep the, the walls and reinforce them in some way, but oftentimes it might make sense um, to just kind of think with the same footprint but, but start from scratch. Anything you want to kind of um, add as a kind of final closing note? Any? I mean, I just think the hard part is getting over the sticker shock of the cost of the ADU. It's like how to finance it and how to get it done. The, the numbers to look at it, is it a smart thing to do for your family? Is it great to have the flexibility for income, for boomerang kids, for you know, God forbid the next pandemic. I mean, it's, it's a smart thing to do as an investment. And so what I really invite homeowners to think about is to just open yourself up to um, the cost of construction. There's, you know, the great thing is we're seeing an increase in the market and what's available. And the good news is there's plenty of ADUs for all of us. So if we're not a good fit for you, you know, talk to Alex, go talk to some of the prefab companies, it's about assessing what your goal is. And if your main um, goal is to keep the budget down, then that's going to help you decide how you get your ADU. And, but they're worth doing. And they're a great way to add more housing to California and a really smart, sustainable way for our cities to grow. So, you know, the, the sticker shock is scary, but take a deep breath and meet with a financial person. And there's a lot of great products out there now. And I think we just all need to build more ADUs. As far as the sticker shock and the numbers, like, yes, anything that ends up in, in the six figures is going to be scary, but it is also important to think of not just what it costs, but that return on investment. So on a cash basis, if you're going to be, you know, renting this out, but also on the equity basis, you know, what you're, what you're building, this is some of the most valuable land there is in the United States. So, you know, some additional space can be a quite valuable investment even if you're not renting it out. I wouldn't be doing my job as a homeowner's advocate if I don't tell every homeowner on this call, you have to get three bids. That's one of the reasons that I'm doing this session so that you have the pool of people to look at, to listen to, so that you can get three bids and make sure that what you're getting is a fair price. We are doing these events in response to your questions. And as an example, one of the questions that I got a couple of weeks ago when we were just starting, like, we've heard there was this 3D design of houses coming in. Can you tell us something about it? So this is event number five. The event number six will actually dive into 3D printing of home. Plus, we will dive in again into the issue of financing and the issue of green building. So if you're interested in the topic, join us again next week. And if you want something else to suggest, email me and we'll make sure we do it in June.